Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. In the past century, the chemical industry in the United States has helped raise the standard of living to a higher level than ever before. To tell the complete story of the development of this industry, or even a single part of it, would take more time than is possible in an episode of the DuPont Cavalcade. So this evening we will trace the progress of one branch of chemistry, a story of American dyes, not by facts and figures, but through the influence the dye industry had on a typical American family, a family that profited by the work of the research chemist and enjoyed the results of his efforts to provide, as DuPont expresses it, Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra will play What Is There to Say from the Ziegfeld Follies of 1933. Pont Cavalcade moves forward. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade tells the story of a typical American family living in a small suburb. The names are fictitious. But the facts surrounding their lives are true, and their experiences might have been those of hundreds of others. They are the Stones, John and Mary, and we first meet them 21 years ago in the summer of 1916. It is early morning. Mary Stone is preparing breakfast as John Stone comes into the kitchen. Mary? Yes, John? What happened to my new blue shirt? Why, uh, I put it back in your dresser drawer yesterday when the wash came back. Well, I couldn't find it. Well, it's on top on the right-hand side. 
You don't mean this gray-looking thing, do you? Yes, that's it. It faded a bit in the washing. Faded a bit? <laughs> I can't wear it like this. John, you know, there seems to be something wrong with all the colors recently. I bought Molly a new bathing suit the other day, and the first time she went into the school pool, it came out all streaked. Well, it just shows. It doesn't pay to buy cheap goods. Cheap? Molly's bathing suit wasn't any bargain. Neither was your shirt. It must be the fall of the dyes. Nothing I've bought lately keeps its color. I can't understand what's happened. Well, I wouldn't be seen in this thing, I'll tell Well, see who's at the door, will you, dear? I have the toast nearly ready, and I don't want it to burn. All right. Yeah, through the curtain, it looks like Mr. Brown from next door. Probably wants to borrow the lawnmower again. You know, the Browns seem like awfully nice people. And Molly walked home with their boy Ted the other day and said she liked him very much. Oh. We must ask him over sometime. Oh, tell him I've been meaning to call on Mrs. Brown ever since they moved here. I will. Well, Mr. Brown, come in. Mr. Stone, I, I wonder if you'd do me a big favor. Why, sure, if I can. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, something's the matter with my car, and I've just had word from the hospital that they want me over there as quickly as possible. My boy Ted's there. I... I wondered if you were too busy to drive me down. I should say not. I'd be glad to do it. Well, what's the matter with Ted? Well, we don't know. He's been feeling badly for the past few weeks. Tired and wanting to lie around. And the boy doesn't want to eat. There's something wrong. His mother and I have been terribly worried. They're making an examination today, and the doctor said, well, he wouldn't tell me anything over the phone. He just said he'd like to have me come right down. Well, you'll be there as quickly as I can get you there. Mary? Yes, dear? I'm driving Mr. Brown down to the hospital. <laughs> A quick run in John Stone's car brings them to the hospital. Stone and Brown enter the reception room. Oh, thanks, Stone. It's awfully kind of you to bring me. I'll wait for you. Well, don't bother. I may be here for some time. If you don't mind, I'd like to find out how the boy's getting on myself. I've heard my little Molly speak a lot about him. My wife will want to know, too. Well, thanks a lot, old man. Well, oh, here's Dr. Alcott. I'm glad you're here, Mr. Brown. I want to ask Ted, you... how is he? I wish I could give you a direct answer. I'm having difficulty in making the diagnosis. There are symptoms that might mean something serious. But I can't be sure without the proper tests. We'll make the proper tests at any cost, Doctor. Unfortunately, we can't. We're out of the necessary biological stains. Biological stains? What are they? Well, I can best explain it to you this way. Bacteria are small and colorless, and even under a microscope, look somewhat alike. In order to distinguish one from another, a bacteriologist has to color them with certain stains. In examining diseased tissue, for instance... These stains are of vital necessity to locate germs. Without their aid, one can't properly diagnose specimens from patients suspected of having tuberculosis, typhoid... Tu tuberculosis? Ted! Why, Doctor, I... I hope not. I uh, hope... You better sit down to Brown. We're not sure at all. Oh, I'm all right. I'm quite all right. Uh, may I see him, Doctor? Why, yes. I'll take you in there at once. But you must promise not a word to the boy or to his mother. I've told her I thought he needed a tonic. I understand. Yes, Doctor. But uh, what are we going to do? We'll do everything in our power. If I only had the proper biological stain, I'd know at once. Uh, pardon me, Doctor, but where do you get these stains? Oh, Doctor, uh, this is our neighbor, Mr. Stone, Dr. Alcott. Uh, he drove me down. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Mr. Stone? Uh, you asked me about the biological stains. We're almost totally dependent on Europe for our stains. At present, there's an embargo, as you know. Nothing can get through the blockade. No dye stuffs are coming in at all. Hmm, dye stuffs? My wife and I were talking about dyes this morning. Are these dyes anything like those used in dyeing cloth or textile? Yes, there's a similarity. They come from the same source, mostly coal tar. Oh, I see. Well, I have a friend who runs a textile mill. Perhaps he knows where we could get some of these stains. I'll drive over there and... I'm afraid it'll be a wild goose chase. We've tried everywhere. If you don't mind my trying. Mind? I'm sure we'll all be very grateful if you can help us. Well, if you'll just give me the name of the dye, I'll go at once. The next day, July 10th, 1916, was one that John Stone was always to remember. Calling on his friend George Phillips, manager of a textile mill in a nearby town, John is surprised and discouraged as he talks with Phillips. You mean we haven't a chance to get any of these biological stains? Well, there isn't much chance of getting worthwhile dyes of any kind. And the Browns have to worry and wonder. It's not only your neighbors, the Browns, who have to worry. It's the whole country. You don't realize how important dyes are. Why, this embargo may throw thousands out of work in the industries that use dyes, besides jeopardizing hundreds of lives. 
I didn't realize... The textile, how... leather, and paper industries are frantic. Ours is just one mill. We've sent men halfway around the world, fairly pleading for supplies. We've scraped the floors of dye houses for anything we could get. We've fallen back on vegetable dye that hasn't been used for years and stuff that's just about useless for our purposes. But how long has this been going on? Two years ago, August 1914 to be exact, this country only had on hand four months normal supply of four dye stuffs. I should think America would make dyes of our own. Well, I wish they could. Don't we manufacture any dyes at all? Well, unfortunately, none that amount to much. What are we going to do about it? Uh, come in. Long distance, Mr. Phillips. I'll take it here. Yes, sir. Shall I go? No, no, sit down, John. Hello? Phillips speaking. What? But, but that's impossible. No, it hasn't gotten in the papers here yet. Well, yes, of course I want some right away. Uh, you, you know our requirements. I'll check the quantity and call you back. Well, there's news. That was my agent in New York. He says that early this morning, the German merchant submarine Deutschland suddenly appeared in Baltimore Harbor. Past the blockade? Yes, and crossed the entire Atlantic Ocean. What? That's astounding. But here's the really good news. She brought 750 tons of dye stuffs with her. <laughs> the Germans know what we need most. If you'll excuse me, I'm going after some for my plant. Dye stuffs, eh? Uh, may I use your phone? You're not going to order dyes, are you? I'm going to call Dr. Orchid at the hospital and let him know, so he can put in an order for biological stains. A few days later, John Stone again calls on his friend George Phillips. We find them in Philadelphia. Well, I see you're at work again. Yes, the moment we got our supply of dyes. Oh, by the way, was your friend the doctor able to get his stains? Oh, yes. And the boy? Ted Brown? Why, he's going to be all right. It wasn't what they feared. And we won't have to send him to a sanitarium after all. Think of that little bit of coloring matter saving all that money and worry. Well, I'm glad to hear it. You know... I've been thinking over what you told me about the number of men who'll be thrown out of work if we don't have dyes. It's pretty serious. Mary's brother's in the wholesale dry goods business. His firm buys from textile mills all over the country. This might put him out of business. You know, you don't realize these things until they strike home. How's it happen we're so short of dyes? Well, the dye industry grew up abroad. We never felt our dependence until this embargo. The arrival of the Dutchland emphasizes the plight of all our dye-consuming industries. And points to the fact that America ought to have a dye industry of its own. It's just a sort of a challenge to well, us. Well, we're meeting that challenge already. Early this year, one of the largest chemical organizations in this country considered the possibility of dye, dye stuff manufacture. Sure. But it would take a lot of research and more trained men than we have in the country. There's a great, great future for the right men. Didn't you do specialize in chemistry in college? Yes, in order to prepare myself to look after my father's textile works. I found my knowledge of chemistry very useful. You, you said you thought there was a great future for the American chemist. There is, John. So, so much so that I'm going to let, let you in on a secret. I'm planning to make chemistry my future. You, you mean give up your business here? My, my brother look after the mills. I've had an offer to go with one of the best American chemical manufacturers. I think I'd like to grow up with a new industry. In 1914, all the coal tar plants in America employed only 528 workers. The official census did not bother even to list American-made dyes. But in the following years, this country's chemical industry awoke to its possibilities. Millions of dollars were invested, and many young Americans entered this new field. George Phillips is one of these. We meet him again after the World War, talking with his friend John Stone on one of Phillips' visits to his hometown. Well, how is the chem chemical industry getting on, George? Well, on its way to success, John. And American dyes? Very encouraging. We're already making some of the finest dyes in the world. And Mary's brother was telling me something about the new fabrics that have been coming in from the mills, and uh, I haven't had to complain about the laundry ruining my shirts lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we haven't reached the point where all the dyes being used here are American-made, but we're producing fast dyes of our own more and more. I'll bet it hasn't been an easy job. Anything but. 
We've had to overcome technical difficulties. We've had to train hundreds of chemists and technical men. It's meant building expensive plants and equipment and learning the complex needs of the dye-consuming industry. That sounds like a real undertaking. It is. I know of one large, well-equipped manufacturing house commanding the best talent money can buy that spent 18 months on one research job alone before they were in any way successful. You know, George, I'm proud that our American chemists are making good on their own. Well, there's no doubt of that, John. There's still plenty of hard going, going ahead. But if the American people back us up, we're going to have an industry that not only will produce good dyes at low cost, but will make America independent in many other things that we need. The DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. Since 1914, the number of American chemists has increased from 14,000 to more than 30,000, while the 528 workers in coal tar chemicals has grown to over 11,000. In no other nation has chemistry awakened on a scale comparable to that in the United States. There were 71 chemical doctorates in 1914. Twenty years later, one-third of all the doctorates in American colleges were chemical. Our story now moves up to 1937. John Stone, whom we first met back in 1916, receives a visit from George Phillips, the former technical man. <laughs> well, George, how are you? Uh, fine, <laughs> thanks, John. I couldn't go back to the city without stopping in and seeing you. I should see you not. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. Eh, it's been a long time since you've honored us with this visit. Over ten years. How's the missus? Splendid, thanks. Splendid. Of course, you see, Mrs. Marley. Your daughter. Yes, she's married now. You married, know. eh? Well, anyone I know? The boy next door, Ted Brown. Ted Brown. Ted... Wait a minute, wait a minute, I remember... That was the boy that you wanted that biological stain for. Oh, that's the one, and you should see him now. 31 years old and big as a house. <laughs> He's a doctor practicing in Boston. And, uh, <clears throat> I'll have you you know, uh, I'm a grandfather. I don't believe it's it. It's a fact. Of the boy of six. That's his picture on the desk well, there. Well, say, he's a corker. He's big for his age, isn't he? Wears eight-year-old clothes. Well, now, that's what I call a fine-looking boy. And you, a grandfather, well, you certainly don't look it. The fact is, you don't look, look a day older than when you came into my office asking me about dyes. The, the day the German sub arrived. Mm, that was a long time ago. Yes, 21 years. Mm -hmm. The day I'll never forget. It was sort of a landmark. My new work started right there. It made me realize the importance of dyes in industry, and I wanted to be in on the ground floor. American dyes. Well, tell me, George, has uh, the American dye industry really lived up to all the great things you talked about back in those days? Yes, indeed, and a great deal more. American-made dyes are the best in the world, and there's hardly an industry that doesn't depend on ours. Oh, now, aren't you taking in a great deal of territory when you say hardly an industry? We hadn't been in the business long before we found that the same raw materials used for making dyes would also give us other useful products. We put chemists to work developing new uses for dye stuffs manufacture. Now this country has an organic chemicals industry that makes dozens of products we can't get along without. Camphor. Synthetic rubber, bases for medicines and perfumes. Chemicals for gasoline and oil, photography, textiles. Hey, now, hold on. You're making me dizzy. <laughs> and uh, we don't have to depend on any foreign sources? At last, the chemical industry in the United States is independent of the rest of the world. Well, I had no idea it had gone that far. And, of course, isn't America alone that's progressed in chemistry. The whole world has become part of this new era of chemical progress. The scientist seems to have come into his own at last as the most important contributor to the comforts and conveniences of today. Mm, putting nature in its place, as it were. No, not exactly. Just putting nature's materials to better use. Excuse me. Certainly. Hello? Oh, hello, Molly. How are you, dear? What? What's that? Well, why, yes. Yes, we'll come at once. Right away. I'll call your mother and we'll make the next train. Now, now listen. Don't worry, dear. Everything will be all right, I know. All right, dear. Goodbye. Is anything wrong? That was my daughter, Molly. 
Little Jack's quite sick. He's terribly worried. I, I've got to look up trains. Well, my car's outside. I can get you there quicker than if you have to wait for trains. Well, thanks, George. I, I'll be right with you as soon as I give my instructions to my secretary. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the home of Ted Brown and his wife Molly in the suburb of Boston, the young father and mother are anxious and worried. Ted, you can tell me. I'll be brave. I don't know myself, honey. Don't trust my own judgment. That's why I want to get into the hospital to be sure. I phoned father. He and mother are coming right away. Oh, that's good. I'll be glad to have them with you. Oh, Ted, it, it all seems too hopeless. Shh, darling. Jack may hear you. No, I, I closed the door to his room. He must get well. Now, don't don't let's think of it. We can't tell a thing, really, until we make the test. But there's the ambulance now. You go in and get Jack ready. <laughs> now, now, take it easy, sweet. We'll pull him through. Oh, how can you be so calm? I'm almost crazy. I know, honey, I know. You've been very plucky, but you mustn't let him know that we're worried. I'll let him in. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Dr. Bates. Thanks for getting here so promptly. Your wife? No, my boy, Jack. Emergency operation? No. I'm afraid... Well, I'm not sure, but it looks like streptococcus. Yeah, I'm awfully sorry, Doctor. I only hope the ambulance doesn't frighten the boy. Saw one of his cousins taken away for an operation once. We're ready, Ted. Hey, come on, we'll go to the boy's room. Don't... Don't bring that stretcher. That all right. would frighten him. No, it's all right, Jack. Here comes Dad. This is Dr. Bates, Dad, my wife. How do you do, Mrs. Brown? How do you do, Doc? Well, son, you all ready? Here's my friend, Dr. Bates. He's come to take us for a trip. How are you, Jack? My throat hurts. Well, we'll have that fixed up in no time, down at the hospital. All right, come on. Dad's going to lift you up. Can I walk, Dad? No, I think I better carry you. I don't want you to get tired with that sore throat of yours. All right, Molly, just throw that blanket over him. Hey, don't I get dressed? No, dear. We're in a hurry. We haven't time to dress you. Now, you must be quiet. You see, Jack, I have to the car back in a hurry, so you'll have to come along as you are. Dad, am I awful sick? Why, no, son. What makes you ask that? Well, going in an ambulance. Why, we thought we'd give you a treat. You know, it isn't every boy who gets a chance to ride in an ambulance. You like to go fast, don't you? Will we go fast? Well, we sure will, right past the red lights with a bell ringing all the time. You're a lucky young man having a doctor for your father so you can have a ride like this. Oh, Tim. Steady, honey. Gee, past all the red lights. Can I ring the bell? Well, we'll see, son. We'll see. At the hospital, the Stone and Brown families with George Phillips anxiously await word from the specialist. Oh, Mother, will Ted never come? Yes, dear, of course. I know it's hard waiting. Oh, but if Jack, if anything happens to him, I'll, I'll never forgive myself. You can't blame yourself, huh? The doc said anyone might pick up the germ. But, but he said streptococcus. I thought that meant there was no hope. Well, now, perhaps the specialist wasn't sure. Oh, yes, Mr. Phillips. He made the test with those biological stains. There's no doubt. But Dr. Brennan said there was a chance. One faint chance. Oh, well. No, dear, a good chance. He said that he's used this, this whatever it is, before, and with good results. Was it uh, sulfonilamide? I don't know. Yes, I, I think that was the name. Uh, do you know of it? Yes. Sulfonilamide is a dye derivative. It's been quite successful in strep uh, streptococcus. Uh, I never heard of it. It's new. But I'm told it's already saved a number of lives. Of course, an infection must be treated promptly if success is expected. Well, we can only hope. Uh, here's Ted now. Oh, Ted, tell me. Jack. He's all right there. Dr. Brennan says he's out of danger. Oh, thank God. Oh, no. Honey, don't cry. Well, you were so brave and things looked badly. Well, you're not going to break down now that everything looks all right. 
<laughs> Jack's going to pine because of this new chemical discovery. Uh, plus the doctor skill, of course. Oh, oh, pardon me. This is my old friend George Phillips, Ted. He brought us over. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Phillips? I've heard Molly speak of you. Mr. Phillips is connected with the dye industry. I know. Medicine owes a lot to you, chemists, Mr. Phillips. Not only the doctors, Ted, but everyone in the world. Thanks to a discovery of research chemistry, another life is saved. From small beginnings in a comparatively short space of time, the dye industry in the United States has become an important factor in the lives of all of us. And its leaders have won for themselves a proud place in the cavalcade of America. Let's look in on a little scene which took place in the home of a young couple just the other evening. Oh, my blue dress is all faded. I'm just sick about it. Faded? Let's see. <laughs> Boy, I'll say it is. More hard-earned cash gone for nothing. Well, I wonder what happened to it. If that young wife were to ask a DuPont chemist why the color in her dress faded, he'd answer her something like this. Probably because the fabric was not that dyed. To give many types of cloth, such as cotton, linen, and rayon, colors that are really fast, chemists have developed a class of products known as vat dyes. Before the vat dyes produced by the DuPont Company are placed on the market, they must pass more than 20 rigid tests. Materials that have been dyed in DuPont laboratories are subjected to every possible color-destroying agent, such as acids and alkalis, repeated washings, long exposure to brilliant light and perspiration. Thus, the fastness of DuPont dyes are known before they are sold. And that's why it is now possible to buy garments or other goods in the most brilliant colors without fear that they'll fade. DuPont VAT dyes are real insurance against disappointment and loss. More and more manufacturers are guaranteeing fabrics to be color fast, and some put tags on their goods stating that the cloth is VAT dyed. Today we enjoy gorgeous colors without sacrificing utility because modern textile houses using the fast dyes that chemistry has created do such fine work. This is true whether the dyeing is done in the raw fiber or in the yarn, whether the goods are piece dyed or printed. Prints, by the way, are very much in vogue right now because you can get printed goods in a great variety of color combinations and designs that are really fast. One of the largest printers of fabrics for men's shirts says this about VAT dyes, quote, They give clear, uniform colors that make it possible to produce more interesting patterns, and the colors can be depended on to last the life of the garment, end quote. The DuPont Company, a leader in the development of America's dye stuffs industry, pioneered in producing VAT dyes. This contribution is just one more illustration of how DuPont chemists are making good their pledge, better things for better living, through chemistry. The eighth wonder of the world, the story of the building of the Grand Coulee Dam, will be the subject of the broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.